Hello and welcome RGMOOC agents. My name is Kate Guthrie Caruso and I'm the scientist from RGMOOC headquarters. I am here to provide you with your brief, finding and evaluating sources, keys to good research. You can access RGMOOC headquarters at bit.ly forward slash RGMOOC course. Alright, so when we're about including research in our arguments, most of the time at college level writing, you're going to find that you do need to include research, but more reasons than just a teacher telling you you need to include it in your paper. Research can help back up your argument, and so that's what we're going to first start talking about, okay? So first off, research can provide you with expert testimony, okay? That means that you're going to, to pick someone who's an expert in the field of whatever the topic is that you're arguing, and bring them in to give your paper added ethos or credibility. Okay. You also may want to include research to provide additional analysis to your argument or to back up the analysis that you have already done. Okay. Research also may give us some background on the topic. It may provide us with facts or statistics that will further um, emphasize our argumentative points. And finally, it can provide anecdotal evidence um, in our paper so that we can provide short little, little story clips to help emphasize that argument that we are ultimately trying to prove. All right, so finding sources. The internet is huge, and that is basically where we go now to try and find our own research. Um, this graph is a graph, um, a basic graph of what the internet looks like. And we live in a day and age where basically anybody can be a published writer. This presents some problems, okay? Because when we go online, the first thing we tend to do is go onto Google and do a search. Well, if we do that, what we're going to find out is that we're only accessing a very small portion of what's available in the, on the internet, as well as we are restricting um, our um, arguments to whatever is popping up first based on the logarithms of whatever search engine we're using. We want to make sure that when we, we do research, we start to figure out how to narrow that down and we're very specific and knowledgeable about what we are looking for. So, to give you an example, okay, um, anyone can be a published author online, okay, you do a tweet and that is published, you can create your own blog, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's a good source to use for a paper. What you want to be doing is finding very specific types of research that are credible that you can then bring in to back up. We'll talk about evaluating credible sources in a couple of minutes and talk about how to um, narrow down our searches so that we're not um, just finding what is easily available. Okay, Literally, when you do a search, you can find thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands of topics, um, articles on your topic. Okay, So to give you an example, this is um, just a Google search for object objectivism. We've talked about objectivism in our course because it connects to um, the video game Bioshock. Okay, so if I wanted to do some research because I'm writing a paper on Bioshock, well if I just type in objectivism in the Google search, well all of a sudden I find that there is 1,120,000 results and it took 0.26 seconds to pull those up. How on earth am I supposed to go through and find what the good research is when it is just being generated out in this way. Okay, so a Google search, just doing that is probably not going to give you the absolute best results. Okay, oftentimes we'll also find that the most popular are popping up at the top. That doesn't mean they are the best sources. All right, so we need to figure out how to narrow down our searches to useful and credible information and we need to know what that credible and useful information is. So here are some criteria to evaluate um, your source to figure out if it is credible or not. Okay. This is specific to online research, although a lot of this applies also to um, research you may do through a library as well. 
Okay, so the first thing you want to look at is, is the publication or the website that it is published on credible itself? Okay, so some things to think about. Look at the ethos of the publisher or the institution. Okay, is it a .gov, a .edu, or a .org website? These are generally better sources than a .com. However, that's not always the case. Newspapers, for instance, if they already have that built ethos, like the New York Times, then we may forego that .gov, .edu, or .org. But a lot of the time, we want to be looking at .gov, .edu, or .org websites to give us good, credible information. Okay. And finally, is there a bias to that publisher? Okay. So if the publisher is known to be a right or left leaning publication, you need to keep that in mind. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't use it, but readers will know if you're only presenting a very slanted view. And because you're writing scholarly essays, you want to make sure that you present both sides of the argument or multiple faucets of the argument. There's never really two sides in a controversial issue. Okay. Um, you also want to consider if there's a financial interest um, in the topic itself that the publisher might have that might create a bias. Okay, and then also, is there any advertising on the site itself? Okay, again, the advertising may or may not um, play a role, but if there are tons and tons of ads, that may give you a clue that there is an issue. Okay, does the author or does the article, excuse me, have currency or relevancy to your topic? This is very important. Oftentimes when we do research, we get lazy and we don't read through the entire article. When we're searching and we come up with over a million results, there's no way we can read every article. But the ones that we narrow in on after quickly scanning the title, as well as, as the first couple of paragraphs, we then want to make sure before we bring it into our essay that we are um, actually picking a, an article that is relevant to our argument. Okay, so in other words, it may provide background or context. It may explain terms or concepts. Or it may provide evidence that helps to support the arguments we are making in our papers. It's nearly impossible to write a paper where we just grab the research and then try to write the paper, usually we want to do it the other way around because our, our research does not actually make our argument. Instead, it is backing up our argumentative points. Okay, and then lastly, it may provide counter argument or counter evidence that you want to bring in. A good paper is always going to show um, multiple sides and a consideration for the audience. If you avoid addressing or refuting counter-argument, um, what you end up doing is you're treating your audience as if they don't, um, aren't going to come up with any of these objections. If you deal with them head-on, it's going to create more ethos for your paper. You're going to become a more credible um, author and your paper is going to be much well, better argued. All right, so Another criteria would be, is the author or the research group for data-driven research credible? Okay, if there's not an author, I would say 90% of the time this is not a good research um, source for you. However, if it is just data-driven, and we'll, we'll talk about authoritative sources, which is one of the types of sources in a minute, that would be the one instance where you can get away with really not having an author. But you need to make sure that either the author or that research group is credible. Okay, So, um, do they have a publication history? This means you also have to do research on top of your research. We may not necessarily be familiar with every single author of every single paper, so Google their name, click on any links about their name, figure out who they are, what they're associated with in order to um, give us an idea of if they're credible. Are they an expert in the field, for instance, and what are their qualifications? We don't want to be bringing in someone who may not be um, qualified to be writing on this topic. Okay. Do they have any bias? Okay, again, you want to look at their, their paper and how they wrote it. Did they address a counter argument? Does it feel like it's a well-argued paper? Okay, another criteria 
would be, is the article or source well supported with evidence itself? Okay, so that evidence, does it include cited or credible sources? Does it include original research? Does it have a logical organization? Again, the paper may not have all of these, but when you're addressing credibility, you want to make sure that it is um, having the majority of these criteria. Okay, and then finally, the last criteria is, is the article timely for the argument you are writing? Okay, if you're writing about something that's happening now, for instance, you're talking about a trend in um, uh, more, more women being gamers, Okay, we want to look at current data, current experts. We don't want to go back 20 years unless we're doing a comparison between what 20 years ago looked like and today looked like. All right, so here is an example. This is from um, an essay, The Nerd as Amateur in Bioshock Infinite. This is an article from the New York Times. Okay, and I provided the link with uh, right here. Um, I just did a screenshot of this for you so we can look at it pretty simply. Um, the title was cut off in my screenshot. Um, but so if we're looking at this very quickly, we can do a very quick assessment of if this might potentially be credible for us. Okay, so first off, the publication, it's the New York Times. It is a .com, okay, if you take a look, it's nytimes.com. However, because um, the publication, New York Times, has ethos in itself, we can probably trust that it is published in a good place. Okay. We may also want to ask ourselves, is there a bias of the New York Times and do we want to be looking for that within the article as well? Okay. There are some ads here. Okay. The Way Way Back Watch trailer, uh, trailer okay, for instance, obviously is not connecting um, to the article itself, which is talking about Bioshock Infinite. However, because um, it is a newspaper, we may be able to overlook that there's an advertisement there. Okay, um, the staff writer, um, it's Harold Goldberg, okay? He um, writes about games, okay? If you do a quick Google search of him, you'll find that he has written and published many, many articles on this topic. He could be considered um, a fairly good expert um, in this area specific to being a staff writer for the New York Times. Okay. Um, and the currency or relevance. Depends on the type of paper you're writing. You may get through this and you find that because this is talking about um, the game itself and how it was created, it doesn't have any currency or relevance to what you're writing about depending on your argument. So you are going to have to read through the article if it's past some of the other tests. Okay, and then finally the evidence. Are there specific examples in this article? Uh, if you actually go to the link and read through it, um, we can see that there are specific examples. Even in my short piece here, okay, um, we get specific numbers. The estimated cost of the project is upwards of 100 million not including marketing expenses, which could add another hundred million, analysts said. So they're bringing in evidence to support their ar the argument that they are making. Okay, and then is it timely? Well, um, as we know, Bioshock Infinite came out recently. This was published on March 21st, 2013. Okay, so it was fairly um, close to that release date, and that would be important if we're writing about this video game. All right, the one thing to keep in mind is research takes time. It is difficult um, and that's okay. The more you practice at it, the more questions you ask, the better you learn how to narrow your search results, the easier it will become. And I'm gonna give you some hints at how to do that. But don't get frustrated if on a very first Google search, you don't find the correct articles for your argument or for your paper. So there are really three types of sources that we might bring into papers um, and knowing what these three sources are will help you both when teachers tell you what they're asking of you as well as when you're evaluating those sources. You can think about what type they are and if they're credible within that um, category. Okay. So the first one is a scholarly source. This is generally what um, college level teachers will ask for uh, when you are writing a paper. 
However, many students misunderstand what a scholarly source is, so we'll define that uh, better in a minute. Okay. Also, we have popular sources. This is actually what the most or what the majority of sources are that you'll find online. And finally, we have authoritative sources. Okay, and I'll talk about each of these. So a scholarly source. A scholarly source is written for an educated or a knowledgeable audience. It's not written for a general audience. Okay, so it's gonna get much, much more specific. So oftentimes when you encounter a scholarly source, it's gonna have the following features. Okay, the author is an expert. They're either an academic or they have uh, scientific credentials in the specific area that they're writing about. Okay. Um, the, there is a formal presentation to the paper itself, such as an abstract and an outline of the research methods. There's a review of previous research in the article. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes scholarly articles will have their own original research that they're bringing in. Um, they're contributing something new to the conversation. And then finally, there are references or a works cited page. Um, these are, are going to be cited in text as well as at the very end of the article. Um, and oftentimes we will find that these are peer reviewed, okay, or refereed is another word that you may, may hear um, used interchangeably with scholarly, okay. What they mean by peer reviewed is um, that the peer review, um, people who are in the field that are experts have reviewed that paper and, and allowed and said that it is worthy of being published, okay. So open access, okay. How do we get these scholarly, scholarly articles online? We want to start going to open access um, places. Okay, so open access is defined by Wikipedia, um, is the practice of providing unrestricted access via the internet to peer reviewed scholarly research. It is most commonly applied to scholarly journal articles. Most open access is free. Um, you just have to know where to look for it. Okay, so some of my favorite open access um, websites is the Directory of Open Access Journals, as well as the Directory of, Directory of Open Access Repositories. Okay, um, on RG MOOC in our week eight, we have um, a whole list of different open access resources. So feel free to check that, that out as well. Okay. So let's take a look at a sample paper that would be under the um, category of scholarly. Okay, this is um, from uh, last week, week seven, um, and it's called Agency Reconsidered. Okay, um, so there are a couple of features we'll look for. First off, we've got expert authors. In fact, the author's credentials are given right at the beginning. Okay, so if you see these asterisks here, okay, both Noah um, uh, Wardip uh, Frunen and Michael Matias have worked, are, are professors at the University of California in Santa Cruz. They're uh, in the Department of Computer Science. Okay. Um, the other two, Stephen Dow and Sadar Salee, um, work for Stanford in the Department of Computer Science. Okay. And they're part of different groups. One's a study, studio, one's a group. Okay. Next, we're looking for the formal presentation. Okay, we see here that we've got an abstract listed right away. Below that, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it, there's keywords, okay? And then we've got headers that formally organize the paper as we go, okay? There's also mentions of previous research, okay? Um, if you take a look um, down here, okay, they're talking about um, what, is defined okay in terms of agency um, in scholarly circles the concept is generally attributed to Janet Murray's 1997 book Hamlet um, on the holodeck cited above okay and then they go into more depth throughout the paper they also include their own original research and their own original ideas okay um, in the abstract they're presenting how they are redefining agency 
okay? We're hinted at that in the title as well. Um, and so their research um, is going to um, back up that argument. Okay, we're gonna take a look at another part of this paper. Um, there are cited sources, okay? You'll notice them, okay, throughout. Um, we wanna make sure that they're doing those proper citations. And in this um, piece, I believe it is um, an AP format, or APA format, excuse me. Um, finally, we see where this was originally published. It was Breaking New Ground, Innovation in Games, Play, Practice, and Theories. This was actually published for a conference originally. If you do just a little bit of research, you can figure that out. Um, and that means that it was peer reviewed. It was accepted into this conference and so it was deemed credible. I wanna show you actually really quick before we move on. This is also the very last page, okay? Um, and so we see the references that are listed. In order for it to be a scholarly source, it should have a works cited page or a reference page at the end. So you can flip pretty quickly to the back and take a look and see if indeed that is cited. Okay. Some people will say, well, um, Wikipedia, for instance, has a reference page down at the bottom, but it doesn't meet the level of scholarly because it doesn't meet most of that other criteria. Remember, on Wikipedia, there is no defined author. Anyone can write. So that's a huge one. Um, they're not um, an expert in the field, while experts may contribute to Wikipedia. Okay. The next one is a popular source. Okay. This is the most common writing online. Okay. It's written for a general audience, whereas remember the scholarly is for the more academic. Okay. Um, and popular sources will often include provocative or creative title. An author is often not an expert, but they are qualified to write on it. So a staff writer, for example, the staff writer for the New York Times, this would make that piece um, a popular source. Okay. Presents research summary, but no original research itself. And there are no citations of sources. They may have quotes from people, but they're not actually citing them in one of the academic um, citation formats. All right, so here's a sample. This is from uh, one of the readings from the MOOC. It's why uh, games will never have a happy ending to their audience. Okay, so first we take a look. It's got a provocative title. I want to read it, right? Okay, so it's speaking to a broad audience there. Okay, the author. Um, the author is um, Andrew Mandula. Okay, and I did just a little bit more research. If you can't see it on here, but if you click on the About Me, he tells us he's a Coloradan going to RIT studying game design and development. Okay, so he is somewhat of an expert in the field, but, but not quite as much as we would find in a scholarly. Okay, and he's a blog writer. That's another thing that lets us know that this may be a popular source. Okay, he summarizes game research. There's no original research in here, but it is a very well argued um, article, but it's for that general audience. Okay. Next, we have authoritative sources. Okay. These provide research and data, facts and statistics, but they don't tell readers how to interpret that research. All right, so it's often done by a government agency, the Census Bureau, for instance, but not exclusively by government agencies. Okay. And it provides only the information. You won't find any analysis included. So two of my favorite um, authoritative sources are fedstats.gov and census.gov. Okay. Um, however, the one we're going to look at as a sample actually applies to this MOOC course, um, and it is um, from the ESA. Okay. So they give us a bunch of statistics on game player data. The ESA actually conducted that research, and it's posted on their website. This actually makes it credible if we're writing about games, okay? Obviously, we're always applying it back to that original criteria. Um, is it credible for the paper we are writing? Okay, and then um, there is only data here, no interpretation. So let me show you really quick. The average gamer is 30 years old and has been playing for 13 years. 68% of gamers are 18 or older, okay? doesn't tell us how to interpret it. This is uh, from a study done in 2013, 
Um, so we just don't have that information of what that means, but it does give us um, the data that then we can interpret in our own arguments. All right, so narrowing your search down, this is important. So here are some keys um, to narrow your search down um, if you're using any kind of database. By the way, databases are not smart, okay? We're so used to smoke smartphones anticipating what we want, what we're thinking. They're not. They're driven by keyword searches, and so we must start to refine our keyword searches. So to do that, here's a couple of hints. Use of quotations around phrases must, that must show up in the dark document, okay? Um, use of and to connect words that must be in the document. Um, some databases like Google automatically assume that and, uh, but not all. Some of the OA uh, databases that I've given you, for instance, you will need to include that and. Okay, Using or to allow for either or word to be used in a document. Use of not to include words that should not be in a document and use of an asterisk to indicate a word that could have multiple endings. So biolog, B-I-L-O-G, asterisk, could give us biology, biologist, okay, anything along those terms. All right, so the final step is integrating that research into your papers. Here are some keys. First, choose quotes or paraphrases that directly connect to your topic, uh, sentence, or argumentative point. Okay. Um, we don't want to be randomly just pulling things in. They must support our argument. Narrow quotes down to the essential. Okay, Only include what will support your argument. So we generally want to avoid incredibly long quotes. Usually we can cut out a lot of fluff. All right, Use quotes to support your argument um, or point out the counter argument but don't use them to make your argument. Okay, Again, if you've seen my video um, from earlier, um, I've given you a link here, bit.ly forward slash citations MLA. Do include those those um, capital letters. Um, this will help you. Remember, you shouldn't really be starting paragraphs um, with uh, quotes or research, um, and you don't really want to be ending them with quotes or research either. Um, there is a way to properly format and, and, and integrate that into your paragraphs. All right. So I'm going to give you a quick example um, from a collaborative essay we've been working on. I'm going to show you the paragraph. Um, this was um, worked on by a couple of people. And in this paragraph, um, from basically here to here is all original. Okay? Um, Allude is aimed at relatives and friends of people living with depression uh, to that they may emphasize with empathize with, excuse me, and better understand them. Remember, this is still in draft form. This intended audience is more likely to appreciate the value of this game, as it may uh, seem as a serious game. Players looking for a quick, fun, and casual gaming experience are less likely to enjoy it. The game is linear, and player agency exists in choices about whether or not to resonate with the passion objects and engage with the ultimate goal of achieving happiness. Okay, so this paragraph didn't bring any research in. So what I've done is I took a look at um, uh, this Agency Reconsidered article that we looked at briefly earlier, and in the abstract, we actually find that there's a definition of player agency, okay? Um, and so I've highlighted it here. This is the entire abstract, um, but I've pulled this out. So we shift focus, okay? So this is moving away from that original definition of player agency. Considering agency instead as a phenomenon involving both player and game, one that occurs when the actions players desire are among those they can take, and vice versa, as supported by the underlying computational model. So in the Titan pad, I decided to bring that into this paragraph to help back it up a little bit because player agency was not very well defined here. Okay, So what I did is I added in Okay, about a half a paragraph here. As discussed in the article, Agency Reconsidered, the authors define agency as, and then I gave that quote, okay, and I properly cited it. And then I go on to further explain it. The engagement of players with the procedural rhetoric, meaning those computational models, okay, 
um, connected to the argument. The argument about depression discovered through the gameplay itself takes players through a process of discovery. Through the engagement with the passion objects, the game emphasizes the desire to be happy, but also shows the struggle of maintaining this happiness. It is by emphasizing the player agency that the intended audi audience satisfactorily connects with the overarching claim of the game, that depression can affect anyone and can quickly overwhelm a person. All right, so even if you're not remembering or haven't done the week on procedural rhetoric and don't know exactly what that means or if you're a little confused about player agency, the goal of bringing in the research is to solidify the point that was made okay, earlier in this paragraph about um, these game choices of whether or not to resonate with the passion objects. Okay, so I'm my ultimate goal whenever I bring in research is to add that support. Okay, and again, that was a collaborative essay. It is still in draft form, um, and there are many people working on it. So um, I expect we'll see some revisions from from that even as well. All right. Finally, here's a video game if you want to get a little practice in evaluating sources and finding research that is guided. Okay, this is provided in our week eight of our GMOOC headquarters. Um, it's called um, Ruger's Riot. Okay, and they'll take you through selecting a topic, finding sources, selecting keywords, identifying citations, and evaluating sources. It's a fun little video game, so I highly recommend you take a look. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Again, my name is Kate Guthrie Caruso, and I'm the scientist from our GMOOC headquarters. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me um, at my email, katecaruso09 at gmail.com, or at my Twitter account, at writercar. You can also find me as the scientist in our GMOOC headquarters. Thank you very much.